Uh, I have the privilege of introducing our guests. Daniel and Devorah Kalik, Messianic believers, made Aliyah to Israel from the U.S. in 2011. Having a Jewish roots teaching ministry since 2007, two years ago, the Lord put a new ministry on their heart called Bless Israel Network. Bless Israel Network is a media organization based in Israel with the initial TV program project called Revelation to the Nations. Oh, that's a heck of a name. I like that name. Written and hosted by the Calix. The program is geared toward believers living in the nations. Bless Israel Network is changing the landscape with a breakthrough program offering the first dedicated platform and worldwide voice for the Israeli Messianic community. The program is designed to establish personal connections between the body of Messiah in the nations to the body of Messiah in Israel and to facilitate reciprocal blessings. Based on the foundations of Genesis 12:3, which says, I will bless those that bless you, and the ones who curse you I will curse. In all the families of the earth you will be blessed. Bless Israel Network is raising up Zion before the nations. So it's my great privilege to welcome Daniel and Devorah Kalik. Um, I don't have a presentation now. <laughs> I can ad lib pretty well, though. Um, my wife is going to share for a couple of minutes about our story and what led us to where we are today, and then I'm going to come up and go over some details about our presentation, or, or rather our ministry and what have you. So I'll give the microphone to my lovely wife, Devorah. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much for having us. Um, we really appreciate these opportunities that we have to share um, about our lives in Israel, how we got there, and then what we're doing there. Because, you know, the Lord doesn't sleep, and neither are we supposed to, <laughs> right? So <clears throat> Daniel and I, as, um, as Rabbi said, uh, made Aliyah in um, uh, January of 2011. We um, had heard the call about in 2008 when we were in Israel um, at, for Passover, actually. And uh, it's kind of a long story. I'm not going to go into all of it. But let me just go back a little bit and say that before Daniel and I met, there was a real theme of Ruth going through my life. And she's my heroine in the scriptures. And um, I uh, met Daniel in 2005. We were both widowed, married before and widowed, and we met unbelievably on a Christian dating site. <laughs> so, anyway, yeah, amen. Hey, there's great things in Christianity and that, and, and some things. They've got the Messiah, and now they just need to return to Torah and to the Jewish roots. Um, so, anyway, Daniel and I met. We married in 2007. And had a lovely ceremony, and we, we were basically in our ceremony doing prophetic acts. We really didn't understand fully what we were doing at the time, but, you know, he knew. Adonai knew. And so, anyway, um, I, uh, there was a whole theme of Ruth running through our wedding. I, we, we had a combo Christian, because we weren't fully into Jewish roots at that time, kind of a Christian and Jewish ceremony. I walked around him seven times um, the way that um, Jewish women walk around Jewish men. And it's symbolic of building our home and, op and having four walls um, open as, Avraham, you know, like a chuppah, you know, it's open on all sides to invite all of the, um, all of the guests to be hospitable and to open our hearts um, and especially to Israel. And when Daniel stepped on the glass, um, we declared, we had the uh, man who married us, who was a good friend of mine, a pastor, we had him explain that we were aligning our destiny with the Jewish people and, and wanted to bring Messiah to them. Little did we know that that would lead us a year later to making a decision that we would make Aliyah. And we did that three years after we heard the call of the Lord and we, um, we actually, this was a real faith move. 
We prayed for three years that the Israeli government would not ask my husband about believing in Yeshua because we didn't want to be in that position of having to deny him. By the way, in my opinion, and I believe it's scriptural, no one should ever want Israeli citizenship so badly that they would be willing to either not share the gospel with the Jewish people or deny Yeshua. It should never happen because the Torah without Yeshua is, as we say in Hebrew, chevel. It's vanity. It's nothing. We need the Messiah. And so anyway, um, and besides that, his Torah, when he comes, is going to be a revelation to all of us because he's really going to teach us the internality, the internal meaning and the heart of the Torah. It doesn't mean we shouldn't keep it today. We shouldn't do our best. That's what we have for righteousness. But we need to understand that we can't do it perfectly today. Of course, I didn't know all that back then. But anyway, um, just to make a very long story short, after we heard the call, we went home for three years. We declared out of our mouths that we were going to make Aliyah, and we packed up a 20-foot container. We sold our home. We packed all our belongings in a 20-foot container. Of course, we had to leave some of them. And we moved to Israel before we ever had our citizenship. And we said, well, if it's God's will, it's going to happen. I don't recommend doing this unless God tells you to. <laughs> um, but we did have, after um, two weeks, we did have our citizenship. And they had told me that I was only going to get um, resident status, permanent resident status. Although under the law of return, if you're married to a Jew, um, or if you have a Jewish grandparent and you can prove that, or one Jewish parent and can prove that, you are supposed to be able to return to Israel. But, you know, there's a lot of things that happen and rules change depending on who you're talking to. That happens here in America, too. We don't like it, but it does happen. But at any rate, by a miracle, and it's a long story how it all happened, but I was granted full Israeli citizenship <laughs> on February 11th. 2011. Oh, February 7th. I'm sorry, that's correct, February 7th. And so um, I remember when she handed me my Teodot Zahut, my Israeli ID, um, I looked at it and it said Israeli. And I said, You mean I'm a full citizen? And she said, Well, yes, of course, you're married to him. <laughs> and I said, You mean I get to vote? And she said, yes, you are a full citizen. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm really like Ruth. Wow. <laughs> so anyway, it's, it's such a privilege to be living in Israel among, because I'm adopted now by the Jewish people, um, you know, spiritually, and I physically have been adopted. I've been accepted as one of them. And so um, it's such a privilege to live in Israel to look out over our balcony and um, out of um, Haifa below us on the mountain on Mount Carmel and pray for our people and for their salvation. And I just want to say one thing before Daniel comes up here. Um, and, of course, he has his own story about all of this as well, about how we met because, you know, women and men, we have different sides of things. Actually, he remembers the date and the time and even, I think, the second that we actually met. So, so hats off to my husband. He's better at that than I am. But anyway, what I, <laughs> but what I wanted to say is that it's so important for all of us to understand that we are part of a body of believers. And non-Jews are grafted in to the people of Israel. And... In Judaism, it's a foreign thought to talk about salvation without the entire community of Israel. And so I have switched from saying I, you know, when I read through and pray the Siddur every morning, I, it's all become we, we, because my salvation, yes, it is important for me to be redeemed, to have done a tikkun nefesh through Yeshua. That's very important. We need to be repaired from the sin, the original sin of, of um, Adam and um, of what the, sin, what the serpent has done to us. But um, once I'm repaired, then I can offer 
repair, reparation, reconciliation with Hashem through Yeshua. And for me to just be focused on my own salvation is also chevel. It's vanity because there is salvation without the community of Israel is a foreign thought in Judaism, in Jewish thought. And so I just encourage you, pull together. That's what the Torah portion is about this week. In order for us to have a geula, a yovel, we must be one. It is our disunity and our arguing over all these things that are keeping Yeshua from returning. So let's love each other. You know, they say baseless hatred is what brought down the temple. That's what the rabbis say. Of course, that was baseless hatred toward Yeshua as well. But baseless hatred in this relationship, it's baseless love that will bring him back, that we love one another, are in unity. We are one people, echad, right? He's echad, and we are to be looking like him. We are to be echad. So let's stop all this crazy arguing of all this crazy stuff. And there's a lot of things that are wrong in the Messianic movement. You know, we all say it's messy, right? It's very messy. Well, Judaism is a little messy too. And when Yeshua returns, he will straighten it all out and teach us what's correct. Let's, in the meantime, love one another and be in unity like he prayed for in John 17. Bless you. You're going to love what my husband has to say. God bless you all, and thank you so much for giving me the privilege of sharing my heart with you today. Thank you, Shirley. Am I on? Yeah. You can hear me? All right. By the way, um, it's always a hard act to follow my wife. Okay, um, you have no idea uh, how blessed it is for a Jew to be married to a Gentile who has a Jewish soul. Okay, now you've all heard the term circumcised heart. That's kind of a reasonable facsimile of what a Jewish soul is. But believe it or not, just because you're born ethnically Jewish does not automatically entitle you to having a Jewish soul. And just because you're born Gentile doesn't mean that you can't obtain a Jewish soul. Amen? Amen. I would say by the looks of the folks that are here in this room, most of you are probably not Jewish by birth. And I'm also praying and hoping that most of you have Jewish souls. Amen? Yes. Wonderful. Well, let me turn on the PowerPoint here and make sure that it's responding. Okay. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, it's responding. By the way, before I get started, okay, um, if any of you are interested in being in touch with us and getting any of our material, and we have lots of material that we put out. My wife does some wonderful uh, teachings. We have a separate little uh, video portion of our ministry, which is called Heartbeat of the Torah, and she records some wonderful ministries, uh, wonderful messages. How many of you know Rabbi Sahi Yitzhak Shapira? By the way, uh, I think today is the actual 30th day of his father's passing, so um, just keep him in prayer. He loved his father very much, and he passed away a month ago, so he's been uh, in, in Shiva as we call it, uh, a dear friend of ours. Uh, this lady sitting next to me, who is my uh, favorite partner in the world, is one of his star students in his online yeshiva. So, um, way to go, girl. <laughs> we have a mailing list, and if any of you are interested in getting any of our updates or keeping up with what we're doing or what have you, I'll pass this clipboard around Please sign up, and it's really important to write at least two things as clearly as possible. One is your email address, because if I can't read your email address, guess who doesn't get an update from us, okay? So please make sure you uh, print it 
as legibly as possible. And alternatively, you can put your phone number because there have been some occasions, uh, we were just in Florida and several people I couldn't read, so fortunately I had their phone numbers. So please sign up and put your phone number on there if you're interested in case I need to call you, okay? All right, dear, thank you. So, Bless Israel Network. What is Bless Israel Network, okay? Well, uh, the rabbi gave you uh, the um, teaser and as the late Paul Harvey used to say, I will now give you the rest of the story, okay? So, when we moved to Israel in 2011, we noticed something sort of a little odd to us, and that is we noticed that there was a serious outpouring of Christian love for the Jews in Israel, but it was primarily focused on the Orthodox Jewish community in Israel, okay? Now, I'm going to use a term that you may not have heard before. Many of you who are Gentiles have used the term unsaved or lost or what have you. It's a familiar term like Old Testament, which we don't like to use because it's really not old to a Jew. So if you're talking to a Jewish person and you use the word Old Testament, that's the only scripture he knows right away he thinks, well, wait a minute, why are you calling what I am looking at every day, and especially on Shabbat, old? It's current. So we like to use the Hebrew scriptures or the Tanakh or what have you. Just something to keep in mind when you're talking to a Jewish person, especially if you're passionate and you want to bring them to Yeshua. Okay? So we noticed that the Christian Zionists, amongst which is a very well-known pastor named John Hagee, who has a large church over in San Antonio, Texas, called Cornerstone. And he has an organization called CUFI, which stands for Christians United for Israel. And we think that it's a wonderful organization because I believe, we believe, that, that Pastor Hagee has probably done more to bring to the forefront of America and the rest of the world and the Christian body the plight and the need and the importance of the Jewish people in God's plan and the role of Israel in his plan for salvation. Amen? Amen? He's done some wonderful things. He only blesses and supports the Orthodox Jewish community. We like to call them, rather than unsaved or lost, we like to call them pre-believers. Pre-believers, okay? You know, there's, you ever heard, heard the term, you look at the glass, it's either half empty or half full? There's just as much water in it, but your perspective is shown by how you define it. It's either half empty or half full. Pre-believers, okay? Pre-believers, amen? amen? Right. All Israel will be saved. All right. So we noticed that there was this ongoing relationship that Pastor Hagee had with the traditional Jewish community but there wasn't any relationship between him and the Jewish believers in Messiah. After all, I am a Jewish believer in the same God, the Father, in the same Son, the Messiah, in the same Scripture, the whole Scripture, not just the so-called Old Testament, but the entire Scripture, and there's a reason why it's only in one book. Because it is the complete scripture. And so we noticed that there was this absence of relationship with the Jewish believers who share all the same important elements that John Hagee and Christians United for Israel does. So why? Why aren't the Jewish believers getting blessed? Well, for those of you who are not familiar with the lay of the land in Israel, a couple of things are important to keep in mind. Israel is a Jewish country, trying very hard, in spite of lots of people who would like to see otherwise, to keep its Jewish character. Messianic Judaism is something that the Israeli government does not align itself with and does not formally support. And the reason, and most Traditional Jews or pre-believing Jews feel this way as well that if, and I'll use myself as an example, 
The moment that I accepted Yeshua as my Messiah, I left, I stopped being a Jew. And I took a journey across a bridge and I plopped down into Christian land. And I am no longer considered to be a Jew. Now, I think most of us in this room probably realize that that's a theological error, okay? Because I am not a Christian, and that's not to denigrate being a Christian. It's not to denigrate Christianity in any way, shape, or form. But why would I stop being a Jew when I accepted my Jewish Messiah as my Savior? Why would I stop doing that? After all, Yeshua was born, raised, lived, taught, died, rose again, and more importantly, will return as a Jew. Amen? Amen? Amen. So we were kind of perplexed that there wasn't any outreach to the traditional, or rather the Messianic Jewish community in Israel. It kind of puzzled us. After all, they need support. Actually, they need support more than the traditional Orthodox need support. They're getting tons of support. But the Jewish believers in Israel are kind of over here in the corner, scratching their heads and wondering, well, what about us? You know, what about us? Here you've got all these wonderful Christians coming to Israel and blessing the Orthodox Jews who, by the way, in many cases, persecute Jewish believers. That's right. And there are some organizations that actually accept donations from well-intended Christians and use some of that donated money and give it to anti-missionary Jewish organizations in Israel who persecute Jewish believers, okay? There is an organization called the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews run by Rabbi Yechiel Eckstein, a good man. He's done a lot of wonderful things. But many of you may not know that a portion of the donations that come to that organization are funneled to Lahava and Yad Liachim, which are two anti-missionary groups in Israel that persecute Jewish believers. Yeah. So we prayed about this situation. Why isn't anyone giving a platform and shining a light on the Jewish believers in Israel? It's not to say that there aren't Christians that are coming to Israel and establishing relations with Jewish believers. There are. And many churches actually have sister relations with some of the Messianic congregations in Israel. But what we're talking about is giving them a broader scope of attention, giving them an opportunity to share what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis to help build the kingdom in Israel. So we prayed, we spoke to people, we were told no one's doing this, it's so necessary, and so after a considerable amount of prayer, we decided to form Bless Israel Network. And if I can get the, there we go. So. Bless Israel Network is who we are, and basically what we're doing, and we'll move to the next slide, as the rabbi mentioned, our initial video programming is a program called Revelation to the Nations. And if we can move to the next screen, try it once more. Okay, now I think there should be a little trailer here. Yes, can we hit that? See if we can play it. Shalom from Israel. And welcome to Bless Israel Network's very first broadcast of Revelation of the Nations. I'm Daniel, and this is my wife, Devorah, and together we are your hosts for this first ever program where we will be bringing you information about the growing kingdom of God right here inside Israel. Our program will be highlighting the Israeli believers in Jesus, who we call Yeshua because that's his Hebrew name. Revelation to the Nations 
will give the Jewish followers of the Messiah a voice out to the world for the very first time. Great. Thank you. So, we're going to uh, share a little bit about what we're doing. What's the logistics? This sounds nice, okay? But give me the details, all right? What we're going to do, is, and we've actually already started doing it, by the way, we are going to interview the leaders. We are interviewing the leaders of Messianic congregations in Israel. And by the way, there's between 150 and 200 Messianic congregations in Israel. And that's not a praise God. I don't know what is. Okay? Amen. And the overwhelming majority of them, if not all of them, were birthed after the reunification of Jerusalem in June of 1967. The reunification of Jerusalem is one of what we consider to be one of the two miracles in the 20th century that put us into the fast track around the final turn and down the stretch they come. Final days. Israel's rebirth in 48, Jerusalem's reunification in 67. So we are sitting with the leaders of these messianic congregations and they are telling their story, what they're doing in Israel. There's a lot of different leaders in Israel, and we get suggestions all the time, of, oh, you should interview such and such, you should interview so and so, and what have you. Here's our focus. There's a lot of teachers in Israel, and as my wife mentioned earlier, the Messianic movement is a little messy. There's a lot of different viewpoints that come under the overall umbrella of Messianic Judaism, or Hebrew roots, or what have you, okay? And I'm not going to take the time to mention them all, but I think you know that there are different viewpoints, there are different organizations, and what have you. We are not going to delve into the minutia of the various theological viewpoints. Therefore, we are not going to be interviewing teachers. It's not to say that we don't love them, we do, because they've got a calling to do what God's put on their heart, and we bless them, and we wish them well. But when you start interviewing teachers, the moment you put a teacher in front of a micro or a microphone in front of a teacher, you're going to alienate part of your audience, because someone's going to agree and someone's going to disagree. We feel that there are four non-negotiable issues which qualify the leaders to be interviewed for our program. One, God the Father. Yeshua the Messiah, Amen. the Jewish people, and Israel. Those are four non-negotiable issues as far as we're concerned. There are lots of other issues that we all know about. Kashrut, the Shabbat, candle lighting, Torah, etc., etc. And there happens to be a lot of viewpoints on some of these issues. We think it's more important to bring the body outside Israel to connect with the body in Israel in a personal way which has not happened before. So what will happen is we are interviewing the leader of XYZ Messianic Congregation and he's talking about the congregation, the particulars about how it was founded, maybe even a little bit of his personal story, what led him to the Lord, but every leader that we interview has to be doing some tangible on the ground outreach in Israel. Lots of different types of outreach on the ground in Israel. They will share what it is that they're doing. I'm going to give you an example of one that we just recently interviewed before we came here. This is Abundant Bread of Salvation, which is run by a gentleman named Brian Slater. This is what they do. They have a weekly soup kitchen. They have a clothes distribution center, a dry food distribution center, furniture distribution center, home visitation for elderly, and Holocaust survivors. Holocaust survivors. 
How many of you know that there are 200,000 Holocaust survivors living today in Israel? 1,000 of them are at least 100 years old. 100 years old. Many of them, unfortunately, live in poverty, which is really a shame. And I'll show you a, a newspaper headline in a moment. They also do dinners for the Holocaust survivors, which is really a nice thing. I'll show you a photograph. Biblical field trips for Holocaust survivors, and they provide medical assistance as well. This is a wonderful ministry. This is a photograph of their soup kitchen and distribution center, which I took on a visit there. And this is, they call the dinners for the Holocaust survivors a royalty dinner royalty dinner. Now think about these poor people. They've been through the Holocaust. The concept of having a country that's Jewish in nature, where they can feel safe as Jews, do you think any of them were thinking that was reality back during World War II? So they're actually living a miracle right now by living in Israel but they really have a lot of challenges. It's very difficult for them. Many of them don't speak Hebrew. So Brian, about once every couple of weeks, rents a restaurant and has the Holocaust survivors bust in and gives them an entire evening. Wonderful food, entertainment, a little bit of music, and scripture as well. And they are very blessed. Some of them have cried because they are just not used to being treated like royalty. So he calls them royalty dinners. Some of them, as a result of being cared for and loved unconditionally, i.e., love your neighbor as yourself, some of them have come to know Yeshua. Amen. Okay, let's try one. There we go. I'm sorry? Amen. Indeed. So what their goal is, they want to expand their ministry in order to address the overwhelming need of poverty-stricken, which includes the Holocaust survivors. And there's what I'm talking about. Of the 200,000 Holocaust survivors alive today in Israel, 50,000 of them live in poverty. Now, that poverty needs to have an asterisk next to it. You live in the United States of America. For most of our lives, we lived in the United States of America. The United States of America is the most blessed country in the world. The standard of living here is second to none. What you're used to here is like no other country. Israel, with all of its modern advances and all the high-tech inventions that it's come up with, and it is really amazing when it comes to its high-tech inventions, still is a Middle Eastern country. And the standard of living in Israel does not compare to the United States of America. So if you live in poverty in the United States, you're still living in the wealthiest country in the world. If you live in poverty in Israel, it's a different story. So you've got 50,000 of these Holocaust survivors that have already endured the Holocaust, and they're living in poverty. And so this ministry that Brian has, Abundant Bread of Salvation, is trying to make a difference. And so we interviewed him. That's Brian with the glasses. Well, you know, sometimes you leave us not discuss the obvious, right? Okay. So this is, an, uh, by the way, I want to share something with you before I move to the, the next ministry. This is something that you will not find in any media publication whatsoever. The need to address the Holocaust survivors in Israel is so great, so great, the government is unable to meet the demands on its own. And so quietly, the government has entered into sort of a wink and nod partnership with 
ministries that are run by Jewish believers like Brian to help the Holocaust survivors. Now, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you would never hear such a story. These days, this is the reality. It's a growing and changing landscape in Israel as far as Messianic Jews are concerned. Matter of fact, a couple of years ago, two of the most well-known TV stations in Israel did a documentary, actually a, a special report, and they compared two groups of people in Israel that have gotten a lot of bad publicity. One, the Messianic Jews, okay? The other one was the anti-missionary, Orthodox Jews. And so they did sort of a side-by-side -side comparison about what they do, which is considered not so good, what they do, which is considered good, and blah, blah, blah. And they interviewed average members of Israeli society. And at the end of the special, the Messianic Jews came out much better received than the anti-missionary Orthodox Jews. So this is a changing landscape in Israel, all right? Another ministry is called um, uh, Streams in the Desert, run by a, a wonderful lady, uh, Mariana, and this is what she does. She has a, mis a ministry to single mothers and children, uh, providing after-school activities, hiking, summer camp, financial assistance. She's a liaison with the government programs, and in Israel, that's not an easy thing to do because in the United States of America, English is the language that the overwhelming majority of people speak. However, if you look at a voting ballot, you might see about 20 languages on it these days, okay? But in Israel, there, it's a melting pot. There's two official languages in Israel, Hebrew and Arabic. And there's two other languages that you hear a lot of. In addition to Hebrew and Arabic, you hear Russian and you hear English. So it's not easy when you're trying to be a liaison with the government when you're dealing with multiple language and multi multiple cultures. Okay, this is a prayer-based ministry. Their goal is to serve the needs of more families, help the growing number of new immigrants, and there are many, many new immigrants coming into Israel every single week. Every single week. We, we drive around and we wonder where they're going to put them all. Because from the first time that I actually went to Israel on my own, when I was a much younger man, um, that was back in 1974. And I noticed one thing immediately when I got there. There were cranes, new construction. You know those guys that sit like maybe 25 stories up in the air and they have those cranes with the, you know. They were all over the place in Israel. Well, here we are, almost in June, of 2017, and guess what? The same cranes, they're all over Israel. It's, it's a country literally growing up as we speak. It's changing every single day, and we're wondering, where are they gonna put all these people? Where we live in Haifa, up on top of Mount Carmel, they put up, just got finished putting up the biggest soccer stadium in the entire country. And surrounding it is what, 5,000 new apartments? At least 5,000 new apartments. It's just incredible what's going on. And, and it's even more amazing when you think that Israel is meeting all these needs while at the same time having to spend more of its GDP on security and military infrastructure because Israel is a country that a lot of its neighbors would rather not see exist. Okay, So Israel has to spend a lot of its money on security and military. And in spite of that, the construction is going on 24-7. 24-7. It's rather amazing. So she has classes for mothers that need assistance, job training, family issues, legal matters, social integration, etc. That's Mariana. Okay? Lovely lady. Then the third example is it's called Geffen. And this is a ministry where they are providing a healthy, safe place for young children whose parents work. Now, that's important. It may not sound like a big deal because there's daycare all over the United States, right? Well, in Israel, it's extremely expensive, extremely expensive. And the average Israeli couple has difficulty coming up with enough money to be able to pair 
uh, pay for daycare in Israel. So uh, the, this gentleman named Adil, who started this ministry, his focus is to be able to provide the same high level of quality for daycare and what have you for the families of young Israeli couples, but at a much lower cost, a much lower cost. And consequently, because of that, he's not really able to pay his volunteers a decent salary. So they're leaving all the time, right? So he is hoping and praying to get more people to volunteer Okay, for, his, uh, for this school, uh, a class, that uh, daycare rather, that he, that he can provide. And so he needs help in order to provide this wonderful daycare for the working families of Israel. Okay? And there's a couple of photographs. And there he is over there on the left. And he's not a Dallas Cowboys fan, okay? nor is he the local sheriff. Okay? That's a Magan Duvid on his hat. Amen? So his goal is to increase the number of kindergartens so more families have this as an option uh, as opposed to traditional, more expensive daycare. Oh, there's a picture of a deal with the blue shirt. So just kind of going through a quick summary of what we're doing. Again, it's something that does not exist in Israel now. And as we talked to people and spoke with leaders and what have you, after we presented the vision of it, they all said the same thing. No one is doing this. No one is giving a platform to the Jewish believers. And so it's, it's, it's so important because what, what will happen here, you took a, talk about the, the tangible aspects of it, the logistics, you're sitting at home, and if you have a computer, you go online, and you can watch one of our programs, which we upload to our YouTube channel, or our website, or what have you. And you can watch one of these programs, and if you are touched, by what this congregation or this ministry is doing, we are going to give you the opportunity to bless them because we're going to provide their contact information. So that way, you can actually establish a direct personal relationship with any one of these ministries or congregations whose leaders we interview. Once you establish that relationship, then that is between you guys. We are out of the picture. And if you choose to donate to them, again, we are not in that pipeline. If you choose to donate to them, 100% of whatever it is you choose to donate, whether it's one time or reoccurring or what have you, goes directly to them. We are not involved in that. Now, I say this. And it's also important to recognize that we're in the very early stages of building this ministry. So at this particular time, we actually need some love and blessing and support for our ministry in order to bring this to fruition reality and do it on a long-term basis. Because what's so important is not just the fact that we want to be able to give you a chance to connect and bless these ministries, okay, but you may not know this, but 90% of the ministries and congregations in Israel are small and underfunded, and they do not have the resources to send their leadership around the world to speak and get support for their ministry. There are a small number of ministries and congregations in Israel that are very well funded and they can afford to send their leaders around the world and what have you. But 90% of the congregations and the ministries in Israel are very small and underfunded and so they are extremely excited about what we're doing because we are giving them a platform and a voice and an opportunity to have their story told and the opportunity for them to be blessed that no one else is doing. So it's extremely important to, re to realize that you can actually play 
an important role. If you're sitting at home and you watch one of the interviews of the leaders that, that, uh, that we record, okay, you can make a donation online and that donation, because as I mentioned, we're only gonna interview leaders of organizations and congregations that are doing outreach, right? That donation will actually help them to increase the outreach that they're already doing in Israel, which includes sharing the good news. So in fact, you can, without ever even going to Israel, not that you shouldn't go to Israel, I heard about the trip that's coming up and I pray all of you go, it is a wonderful experience, but even if you aren't able to go, you can actually bless the believing body in Israel with a couple of clicks on the computer which will help build the kingdom in Israel by bringing more Jews to faith. And I think, at least I hope, we all know that when enough Jews in Israel get down on their knees and cry out, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Need I say more? Okay, this is, this, is, this is the big event. Okay, this is the big event. This is one of the reasons why my wife and I decided to move to Israel. We, we, we don't want to be in the nosebleed section or be outside the stadium. We want to be on the 50-yard line or as close to the 50-yard line as we can get. Okay, so that's why we moved to Israel. So as I say, you have an opportunity to bless your Jewish brethren in Israel, and Genesis 12, 3 says, I will bless those who bless you. So there's a reciprocal blessing awaiting you. We have a Facebook page, so if you wish to, you can like us on Facebook. We have a growing number of folks that are, uh, and by the way, my wife puts some wonderful material on our Facebook page, so you'll really be blessed by that. We have a YouTube channel, and uh, this is what I was talking about here, these little icons. This is the heartbeat of the Torah, which are messages that my wife has put together. Uh, there's a, our, one of our programs there, and that guy in the left, well, you know, big blabbermouth over there. So, um, oh, thank you. Here's that five dollars I promised you. <laughs> Uh, this is, uh, if we can play this clip, I'll just give you a little intro to it. This is Eitan Shishkoff, who is one of the most well-known Messianic leaders in all of Israel. And we actually did interview him, even though he's not part of the 90% that's underfunded, he's involved in a wonderful project trying to secure some land so there's a national hospitality and conference center for the Jewish believers in Israel. That does not exist. So we interviewed him. So he uh, was nice enough to allow us to interview him. But if you can play this clip, he'll give you a little reaction to what we're doing. I love the two of you for uh, reaching out and seeking to create this connection uh, with people in the nations because uh, it's so necessary for people to know us as, uh, as human beings and for people to, to see and feel what's happening here in the land because I think there are many people, I think there's a great reservoir of interest in and of desire to be involved with what's happening in Israel, but people just don't know. And so thank you for giving us a voice. Some shameful boasting on our part. Please forgive me, okay? But uh, we love Eitan very much. He's a, he's a great guy. Some endorsements. Jonathan Burnus. Okay, I completely support the vision of Blessed Israel Network to provide a platform to leaders of the Israeli congregations and ministries to share what they are doing to build the kingdom of God in Israel. Rabbi Yitzhak Shapira, revelation to the nations is needed in these last days. Daniel and Devorah's vision to connect the voices of authentic Israeli believers to the nations will serve as a great hub for the body of Messiah until all Israel will be saved. Amen. Boaz Michael, First Fruits of Zion, we are living in a time when Israel is most often slandered and marginalized. Daniel and Devorah have a vision for the land of Israel and a mission to facilitate the message of Messiah coming forth from Zion. I appreciate their heart of service to the community of faith in the land and pray they will have much success in their mission. Thank you, Boaz. And on the Christian side, 
Dr. David Reagan from Lamb and Lion Ministries. I praise God for the visionary venture he has placed in the hearts of Daniel and Devorah. It is certainly deserving of widespread support from the Christian community. So, you all see these images up here? Okay. So, if you got three or four cups of coffee from Starbucks during the course of a month, that might cost you 20 bucks. If you got a pizza, that might cost you 20 bucks. If you went to the movies, okay, that might cost you 20 bucks. We're here today to ask if you would consider taking that $20 and sowing that into the kingdom by blessing our ministry. There's lots of ways that you can do it. I picked that figure because it's small for most people. It's, it's, not a, it's not a major hurdle. And, you know, we don't expect, we ask, people pray, you decide what God leads you to do. And if God leads you to bless our ministry, then we thank you and we thank God for that. This is our website. On the website, you've got a donate button. You can click on the donate button right there, and that's the page. PayPal is an option. And right there is the page where you can pick and choose whatever you might wish to donate. And you can do ongoing if you choose to. There are, you can mail checks. It's entirely up to you. So we just simply bring this vision before you. We are marching. We are moving forward. We've got a couple of programs already recorded. When we get back, we will be doing some more. And we simply pray that God will bless this, and we ask for your blessing as well. Now, this uh, screen right here, uh, the rabbi is going to talk to you about if you choose to write a check today, I believe AMC has their own uh, vehicle, how it's going to be done. In the future, if you choose to, then this uh, slide would ap apply if you wanted to do something on your own outside of what happens today. Thank you very, very much for allowing me to share this.